An island once known for coconut groves now carries the weight of a nation. In 1961, it began as a small refinery, almost invisible on the map. By 2025, it has become a billion-dollar giant, processing 180,000 barrels of crude every single day. For Filipinos, this is not just steel and pipes. It is jobs. It is power. It is the reason the lights never go out. But here lies the danger. What happens when 115 million people depend on one island, one system, one refinery, a storm, a breakdown, a single political fight, and the nation could be thrown into darkness? This refinery is both lifeline and weak point. And that is why every expert whispers the same warning. The giant may fall. In the next few minutes, you'll see how this single project became the heart of Philippine energy and the hidden danger no one dares to speak of until the very end. Because the truth is simple. When one island powers a nation, the whole future hangs by a thread. In 1961, a small fire was lit in Lime Bataan, an oil refinery built by Esso that would one day power a nation. At first, it was only a tiny plant, a small piece of steel compared to the giant refineries in the world. The Philippines at that time was still a young country, hungry for energy, hungry for growth, hungry for a future beyond coconut groves and fishing boats. This refinery gave the country its first taste of energy independence. Every barrel processed in LeMay meant one less barrel shipped from abroad. Every job created in the refinery meant one more Filipino family fed. But the truth was clear. This plant was still fragile. Its output was small. Its design was simple. And no one imagined that history would one day test it in ways no machine was built to endure. The global oil giants looked at LeMay as just another small asset. For them, it was business. For Filipinos, it was survival. Still, this single project planted the seed of something greater, an idea that the Philippines could build its own energy backbone. What began as a modest facility soon became the symbol of hope for a nation that wanted to stand on its own. And here lies the twist. Decades later, when other refineries would close, LeMay's plant would remain, the last refinery standing in the country. This is where the story of the Philippines' energy lifeline truly begins. But what event would finally push the nation to take control of its own energy future? The 1970s arrived with fire and fear. When the world's oil supply was cut, the Philippines nearly went dark. Prices of fuel exploded, gas lines stretched for blocks, factories slowed, jeepneys stopped, and families felt the pain of a world suddenly addicted to oil it could not afford. The message was brutal. Dependence on foreign oil was a national weakness. In response, the Philippine government stepped in. Through Petrofil and the newly created Philippine National Oil Company, PNOC, the state took control of the refinery in Bataan. For the first time, this plant was no longer just a private business. It became a national shield. Every barrel processed in LeMay meant the light stayed on. Every shipment kept hospitals, factories, and schools alive. The refinery was now a symbol of national survival, but with state ownership came a new force, politics. Appointments, decisions, and directions were no longer only about business. They became tied to the political winds of Manila. Still, without this bold move, the refinery might have collapsed in the storm of the 1970s. Instead, it stood firm, the heartbeat of Filipino energy. And in the shadows, one truth grew clearer. To secure its energy, the Philippines could not walk alone. It needed global partners, modern technology, and deeper investment. What began as a defensive takeover soon raised a bigger question. If survival required allies, who would the Philippines trust to modernize its only lifeline? In 1994, a new power entered Bataan, not with guns or ships, but with oil and money. The Philippine National Oil Company, PNOC, signed a deal with the energy giant Saudi Aramco. Together, they created Petron, a joint venture that turned the once fragile refinery into a true global player. For the Philippines, this was not just a business move. It was an alliance with the world's biggest oil kingdom. Suddenly, the refinery had access to steady crude supplies from the deserts of Arabia. Pipelines flowed, ships docked, and the refinery's furnaces burned hotter than ever. Billions were poured into modernizing operations. From outdated machinery came new distillation towers, safety systems, and improved output. The Bataan plant was no longer just surviving, it was competing. Filipino workers gained stability, learning advanced methods from Saudi experts. 
For families across Luzon, it meant more reliable fuel, electricity, and jobs. At last, the refinery looked like a real hub in Asia, not just a struggling island outpost. This was the first time people believed Bataan could truly stand alongside the world's great refineries. But growth always comes with pressure. Cars, factories, and industries were multiplying. By the early 2000s, demand in the Philippines was rising faster than ever. And one looming question remained. Could this refinery, reborn with Saudi help, keep up with a nation whose hunger for energy was doubling with every decade? In the 2000s, a Filipino giant stepped in, and the entire game changed. San Miguel Corporation, one of the country's most powerful conglomerates, acquired Petron. For the first time, the nation's last refinery was fully in the hands of local power. And San Miguel did not play small. They announced a staggering $2 billion expansion plan called Refinery Master Plan 2. It was more than an upgrade. It was a transformation. Construction crews swarmed Bataan. New processing units, desulfurization plants and advanced systems rose from the ground. The refinery that once looked like an aging relic was becoming a mega hub of energy. For ordinary workers in LeMay, it felt like a miracle. Their dusty hometown suddenly pulsed with billions in investment, thousands of jobs, and modern towers that lit up the night. Families saw their future tied to this steel giant, but the shock spread beyond Bataan. Across Asia, rivals took notice. The Philippines, once energy dependent, was building one of the most advanced refineries in the region. This was not just about fuel anymore. It was about national pride, industrial power, and survival. Every barrel processed meant fewer imports, stronger security, and more money staying inside the country. Yet inside this billion-dollar project lay a hidden revolution. The upgrades were not only making the refinery bigger, they were changing the very nature of its output. And the next chapter reveals it all. What exactly was built inside this expansion that shocked the industry? And why did it change everything for the Philippines? In 2014, Bataan stopped being just a refinery. It became a fortress of fuel. San Miguel's Refinery Master Plan 2, RMP2, was complete. And the old plant had been reborn as a full conversion refinery. This meant no more wasted heavy oil. Every drop could now be turned into high-value, clean fuels. Inside the complex, new delayed coker units crushed low-value residues. Hydrocrackers and reformers reshaped molecules into gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel that met the toughest global standards. For the first time, the Philippines was producing Euro 4-compliant fuels at home, not begging foreign refineries. It was more than science. It was sovereignty. Each liter refined in LeMay was a liter that didn't need to sail across oceans. Each truck filled on Philippine soil was a step toward energy independence. The people felt it too. Drivers noticed cleaner air. Fishermen and farmers saw steadier prices. Workers in Bataan knew they were standing at the heart of a national milestone. And abroad, the world took notice. Bataan's upgraded refinery could now stand shoulder to shoulder with giants in Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. No longer a relic, it was a competitor. But this triumph came with a shadow. Upgrading technology made the refinery stronger, but it also made it more exposed. A storm was coming, one far bigger than any typhoon. A storm that no machines, no coker, no hydrocracker could resist. Because in just a few years, a global shutdown would hit. Airplanes would stop. Ships would stall. Demand for oil itself would collapse. The question was simple. Could Bataan survive the pandemic? In 2020, the world stopped, and so did oil. When COVID-19 hit, planes were grounded, buses empty, and factories silent. Global fuel demand collapsed overnight. For the Philippines, the shock was brutal. In Batangas, Shell closed its refinery for good. Once a proud fuel hub, it was gone turned into a mere import terminal. Suddenly, the country lost a critical lifeline. In Bataan, Patron faced the same storm. The giant 180,000 barrel per day refinery was bleeding. In 2021, it suspended refining, a silence that shook workers and towns that had lived off its fire for decades. Fear spread. Would jobs vanish? Would fuel shortages bring blackouts to Luzon and beyond? From three refineries in the 1990s, the Philippines was now staring at the unthinkable. Only one refinery left standing, and even that one was in doubt. For families in LeMay, the refinery wasn't just machines, it was food on the table. For the nation, it wasn't just fuel, it was survival itself. Every Filipino felt the weight of a single question. What happens if Bataan falls? 
but then a hard choice saved at Petro. Petron decided to fight, restructuring debts, slashing costs, and restarting operations. It wasn't easy. The world was still in lockdown, but the refinery lit up again, like a lighthouse in the storm. That moment made history. From three refineries decades ago, only Bataan survived. It became the last fortress of Philippine energy, but survival was only the first step. The real test was still coming. How can one refinery, standing alone, keep the lights on for an entire nation? By 2022, one island carried the weight of an entire nation. The Bataan refinery roared back to life, not only refining oil but now powering itself with a 184 megawatt power plant. This meant the island could stand on its own. Fuel and electricity made side by side. Every single day, the refinery processed 180,000 barrels of crude. From this fire, it produced the gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel that kept Luzon alive. Jeepneys filled their tanks from Bataan. Airlines fueled their planes from Bataan. Even the trucks that carried rice and food from the provinces traced their strength back to this one refinery. It was no longer just a plant. It was the heartbeat of the Philippines. But with power came fear. For the first time, almost the entire energy lifeline of Luzon ran through a single gate. If that gate ever closed, through a fire, a typhoon, or even sabotage, the nation would stall. Workers in Laimi knew this truth. They called the refinery a giant, but even giants have weak spots. Every Filipino riding a jeepney or boarding a flight was tied to one fragile island in Bataan. The refinery had become a lifeline and a gamble. One shutdown could mean paralyzed streets, grounded flights, and empty stations across the nation. This is why the story of Bataan is not just about size, it's about risk, hidden inside strength. And now the question becomes clear. What is the hidden danger that makes this giant both a shield and a weakness? The refinery that powers Luzon cannot live a single day without foreign oil. This is the truth hidden under all the steel and smoke of Bataan. Every barrel that, that runs through its pipes comes from imports. The Philippines has no large oil fields, no deep reserves of its own. Without the ships that cross the seas, the refinery's fire would die. No crude means no fuel. No fuel means no light, no movement, no life for the cities that depend on it. For jeepney drivers, this truth cuts deep. Even if the refinery is the strongest in Southeast Asia, their gas still comes from crude, bought with foreign money. For airlines, it means every ticket, every takeoff is chained to tankers arriving safely in Manila Bay. Energy independence is still an illusion. What looks like freedom is actually a tightrope, always waiting for global prices, wars, or shipping lanes to break it. The refinery stands like a giant, but its legs are not its own. They are borrowed, fragile, and costly. Every barrel refined is another barrel imported. Every peso earned is another peso spent abroad. This is the hidden weakness of the Philippines' energy story. The refinery looks like a shield, but behind it lies dependence so heavy, it could crack in a single global shock. The question is no longer whether the refinery is strong. The real question is this. If the lifeline depends on foreign crude, what does that mean for the Philippines' future? The refinery giant is not the end of dependence. It is the proof of it. For 60 years, the Philippines built steel towers, tanks, and pipelines in Bataan. It became the last standing fortress of fuel. Yet inside this fortress, the heart still beats to the rhythm of foreign oil. The truth cuts sharp. A nation cannot be free if its lifeline arrives only by sea. Every drop of fuel, every jeepney ride, every plane in the sky still depends on ships crossing oceans. The refinery is both a miracle and a warning. It keeps the lights on, but it also reminds Filipinos that one shock, a war, a blockade, a price spike, could bring darkness overnight. True independence will not come from refining imports. It will come only when the Philippines finds and owns its own oil and gas. The refinery shows power, but also weakness. It is a giant, but its feet are made of glass. And that leaves one final question. Will the Philippines unlock its hidden energy or remain forever a giant with fragile feet? From 1961 to 2025, one island refinery grew from a small plant into a giant that lights homes and fuels dreams. It kept the nation alive through crises, blackouts, and wars of price. For every jeepney on the road, every plane in the sky, this giant carried the weight. But the story of energy security is not finished. A refinery built on imported oil is strong, but also fragile. 
Its power is only as real as the choices the Philippines makes next. Will the nation stay chained to ships from abroad? Or will it finally unlock the treasure under its own seas? The future hangs in the balance, and the time to decide is running out. Subscribe now for more hidden stories.